Welcome everyone on this beautiful evening. I think you can still hear the thunder out there. Anyway, um, today is a great occasion because it marks our first event in our seminar series of the Bologna Institute for Policy Research. As you all know, uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, is at its core a research university. Uh, and here at SAIS Europe, while we focus a great deal on teaching, all of our faculty are heavily engaged in research. And um, the research that we do uh, tends to be uh, very interdisciplinary uh, and covers topics from economics uh, all the way to Italian politics. Uh, for example, Professor Pasquino in 1981 uh, taught me everything I know about Italian politics. and. Uh, it is not his fault that I know very little about it, but that was a, a very long time ago. Anyway, um, the uh, Bologna Institute uh, for Policy Research is essentially the, the research division of SAIS Europe uh, and promotes the research essentially that, that the faculty is doing. And of course, it's very important for us to bring our students into what we're doing in, uh, in the uh, research realm. And so during the year, generally on, on Mondays and Thursdays, uh, we will be inviting uh, scholars from all over Europe uh, and elsewhere to come to give seminars on various themes together with our faculty. So I really do hope that all students will take advantage of this over the year because it's not just what we learn in the classroom uh, that you came to SICE for, but rather also uh, things that are outside, outside the strict uh, curriculum. So um, if you want to learn more about this, I, I think hopefully everybody al already has marked on their computers uh, the Beeper homepage. Uh, and we also, it's active on, on Facebook and, tw and Twitter. So um, without further ado, let me uh, turn uh, the floor over to Eric Jones, Professor Eric Jones, uh, who will be chairing the session. So Eric. regions, 
Uh, then we had some communal elections and a large number of different local governments. Uh, and we had a constitutional referendum, uh, an attempt for the citizens to reduce the number of parliamentarians uh, from a constitutional requirement that 315 in the Senate, plus some lifetime senators, and 630 in the Chamber of Deputies, uh, to a much smaller number, 200 and 400 respectively. Now, what we can what we can estimate based on the current projections is, is that of the six regions that elect their regional presidents, three of them appear to have gone to the center left. Uh, that's Tuscany, Puglia, and Campania. Three of them appear to have gone to the center right. That's the Veneto, uh, Liguria, and Neymarque. Uh, and, and one in Valdosta doesn't have those kind of direct elections. The center right uh, appears to be the largest political group that's going to elect. Um, what we can also estimate from the, from the results is that about 70% of the population has supported this referendum, this constitutional change, to reduce the number of uh, parliamentarians down to that 200 400 threshold, which implies a lot of work re engineering uh, parliament and the electoral system in order to accommodate this kind of number. Um, what we don't know, based on those projections, is what all this means. So, what I'd like to do at this point. Uh, is invite you to give a warm welcome to our speakers, uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, John Palacios uh, to open up our conversation to, uh, to help us better to understand uh, what these what these results tell us. But please, first, if we can have a round of applause. Okay, <clears throat> can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, I'm sorry, Eric, because I have some problems in hearing you. So virtually, you could have said uh, everything about me, and I'm not aware of it. Uh, anyway, I got that uh, it's my turn now, so I will try to to make a very short introduction, as we agreed. Uh, just because uh, it's a, I, I got the impression that we want to discuss and not just to have uh, a number of, of, of small lectures. Okay, so my first impression, uh, let me start by saying something about the referendum, um, because uh, I think that uh, maybe it may be useful to uh, say something. I expect that your audience is made of uh, people that are also, um, also from foreign countries, so um, I would have not needed to say this to an, to an Italian audience, uh, this outcome was not surprising. Uh, and in particular, it's not surprising because we know quite well that in Italy there is a, a long-term uh, feeling of mistrust uh, in uh, politicians. That's the point. Um, I think it's fair to say before the audience that I was uh, against the, the cut of parliamentary representatives for many reasons, but my main reason is the fact that I think this feeling of anti-politics should not be really encouraged. But the point is that we have to accept the real thing. We know quite well that uh, uh, a feeling of mistrust in politician has always been a feature of the uh, uh, of the Italian politics. Uh, it exploded really at the time of Tangentopoli in the early 90s. And actually, it has been nurtured for um, or for some decades. So we can say, uh, we can say so. Uh, and probably the point is that uh, uh, anti-politics takes different forms. Uh, also, Berlusconi started this with this idea of uh, uh, that this idea that outsider could be better than professional politicians. And uh, then the last version of anti-politics is that of the Five Star Movement, uh, the idea that everybody can do everything and uh, preferably people should enter politics and stay for a short time. So it's not a surprise. Uh, I think that uh, I, I don't want to say anything about uh, technicalities uh, concerning the referendum because I know that Justin and Gianfranco are much better and more expert than me, but as a scholar of political communication, I should say that usually when a referendum concerns uh, uh, technical aspects also, 
reform, uh, constitutional reform, uh, uh, it's quite uh, uh, likely that very often the mass public uh, receive a simplified message. In that case, the message was uh, we can cut those people because uh, uh, they are an expense, they are a cost. So at the end, uh, the idea was that democracy can be costly. <laughs> and so be it's better to uh, cut the number of people in order to save money. Mm? And, and that's all, I think. The point is that clearly anti-politics is not just an Italian uh, characteristic, an Italian feature, but uh, I think uh, um, my personal view, at least, uh, is that it's quite dangerous to con going on um, to go on uh, thinking that um, politics cannot be a professional thing, hmm? and that uh, uh, pro and, and this mistrust in terms of professional politics is dangerous because at the end we never face the true problem. I think one of the true problems of Italian politics that is that of um, uh, selecting and uh, educating people hmm? uh, because the problem of the selection of politician uh, started when the, the, the mass party uh, entered in a deep crisis and I think that has not been solved until now. And that's all for the referendum. Let me say a few words also uh, concerning the, the outcome of the administrative election then maybe I will develop more some points. Uh, um, I, I'm I'm a scholar of leadership and I think this election has much to do with leadership from many point of view, at least just looking at the first, uh, 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 the first electoral uh, uh, results, we may say that uh, first, uh, uh, two incumbents were, uh, have been very successful and they have been successful, I think, because uh, of themselves, okay, that there, there certainly has been a personal factor, a personal character in the case of Daya in Veneto and in the case of De Luca in Campania. And, uh, and this is a, um, interesting, of course, we, we may discuss later about the, the COVID crisis effect that, that can uh, play the role, I think. And uh, uh, the other point is that um, if I look at the list uh, of the, 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 the regions and the, 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 the prospective winner, uh, I think it's also interesting to say that uh, uh, the central right probably didn't have a very competitive uh, uh, candidate in some cases, even if the climate maybe is not, is certainly not disfavorable to the to the right. Uh, I think we should uh, uh, discuss a bit of what is happening uh, within the Five Star Movement uh, from the point of the leadership, but maybe I, stop, I can stop here and we can develop more. I think that the great victory of Zaya is extremely interesting to talk a bit also about the leadership of the, the League and maybe to say also something about uh, the person that I consider the rising star in the right, that is Giorgia Meloni. Okay, I think I can stop here for now and I leave uh, the room to the other two panelists. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent, thank you Donatella. Justin, I wanna see if I can get you to come back on these constitutional issues perhaps and then any other reflections you might have. Sure, um, just, like, just like Donatella, I'm going to be uh, forthright with you. And I'm going to say what I said in January in another uh, seminar that we organized just before the, uh, just before the pandemic. I, in my opinion, this uh, constitutional referendum was pure gold populism. Um, and given the result of the, uh, of the referendum, from this point of view, I think, uh, I think populism has, uh, has prevailed. And uh, it's interesting to note, if I may, that uh, the three speakers, Donatella, Gianfranco, and myself, were all three in favor of no. Uh, evidently, without realizing it, we, we must be part of an elite uh, at a certain point. And I see the dynamics typical of, of populism that we've been looking at over the last uh, few years uh, emerging even with, this, even with this referendum. Let me, however, also clarify 
that uh, democracy is not in peril in this country because of the result of this referendum. The reduction of the senators from 315 to 200 and the deputies from 630 to 400 will not put in peril uh, Italy's democracy. It will create, there is, a, in my opinion, institutional short circuits. Uh, what we will probably need to do is to uh, review the standing orders of the two chambers of parliament because there will be an issue in the next parliament that will be elected and here there's also an issue that I'll maybe touch on afterwards how long this parliament will last after this referendum uh, of uh, changing the standing orders in order to ensure that all the uh, political forces are properly uh, represented in the uh, parliamentary committees then there is the big question mark concerning, and here the expert is by no means me, but Gianfranco, the issue of the, of the electoral system. There, there has been a kind of presumption that if the referendum uh, were to be successful, and it has been successful, this must per forza lead to the approval of an, an electoral law characterized by proportional uh, representation. Um, I will. Ha I have no problem in saying that this was an extra reason for me to uh, personally vote no in the referendum because I do not see the introduction of, uh, of a system of proportional representation as being a good thing for uh, Italy's political system. But I hope this is another thing that we can we can debate. Um, the, the the issue, however, is to see whether. Uh, after uh, the victory in this referendum, whether this parliament will, will actually be capable of uh, uh, of changing the uh, changing the electoral system, it also appears inevitable, according to some, that there will have to be a modification of Article Fifty Seven of the Italian Constitution. Excuse me for being technical for a second. I.e., a Senate that is elected on a on a regional basis, because there are certain uh, regions that will be uh, mal represented, as it were, because of this reform. And I just saw uh, a few of the results before if, before coming to this webinar. As some who are in this room, I was teaching until six. So I only got a uh, a short chance to look at the results. But there seems to be a little interesting result in Friuli Venezia Giulia, where the no vote seems to have got more than forty percent. And I am not surprised by that because Friuli Venezia Giulia is one of the regions that would have been most hit by, in terms of representation in the two, in the two chambers, with less than 38%, I think, in the chamber and less than 43% in the Senate. So that's a, an interesting result from, uh, from that point of view. Um, a political comment. The uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle, Di Maio, and all the other leaders of the of the Cinque Stelle have succeeded where Renzi failed. Uh, they have uh, managed to, and where Renzi failed, where Berlusconi failed. The last time there was a successful uh, amendment to the constitution was in, uh, was in 2001. Other attempts to reform the constitution have failed. Probably their idea, and they had some constitutional advisors, the idea of a very specific modification to the constitution where there was a clear message i completely agree with donatella on this point a very clear message to the electorate of reducing the number of parliamentarians worked uh, if you want my view from a technical point of view it was still a what would be called a heterogeneous question that was put to the italian people because personally i would have been in favor of a, a strong reduction of the members of the Senate, but not of the Chamber of Deputies. Actually, I would have uh, been in favor of the Senate being transformed into a Senate of the Regions or, or a reform of this sort. But that, at the moment, does not seem to be uh, something that's on the, uh, on the cards. But I think uh, we would make a mistake if we think that it will be easy sailing from now on in Parliament in approving all those changes that were supposed to go with this uh, reform of the constitution. I have a sneaky feeling that it will be more difficult and from this point of view I think uh, the leader of the Democratic Party 
Nicola Zingaretti is in for a few more surprises, unpleasant surprises. Well, John Franco, they, they've, they've covered a lot of ground, but it would be great if you could help us put it all together and give us a sense of how we got here and, and, and where you think this is going to go. Well, first of all, let me say that I'm, I'm comfortable with this thing. Um, the good news is that uh, Justin, Donatella, and I lost. Uh, badly because we we were favoring the no vote for very many good reasons I, I would say and the Italian electorate has shown us that it it wants and in fact I would add that it deserves some very simple reforms like cutting the number of parliamentarians uh, the the goal ought to be to improve the functioning of the Italian Parliament but there is no reason to believe for a moment that just by cutting the number of parliamentarians, you automatically get a parliament that is more agile. No reason. On, on the contrary, that is, if you think for a moment what a parliament, a contemporary parliament in a contemporary parliamentary democracy should do, you will realize that it is not uh, improving uh, the situation just reducing the number of parliamentarians. If you look at the number of laws passed by Italian parliaments so far, they are usually slightly more than the laws approved by the German parliament, by the British parliament, and by the French parliament, even though French, the French parliament works in a different institutional context. Second, you ought to focus on what a parliament ought to in fact do, that is representing the people, representing their needs, their expectations, their hopes, if you want their emotions as well, but in some cases their preferences and their interests. Okay? And do, do you believe for a moment that reducing the number of parliamentarians, you get a better political representation? It is very, very unlikely. Indeed, the debate has now started whether few parliamentarians would represent uh, some regions, some small regions, uh, for instance, Basilicata, for instance, the Friuli Veneta Giulia that Justin mentioned, and even Valle d'Aosta, incidentally, is a very, very small region. Second, if you believe that re political representation is an important activity by contemporary Italian parliaments, you may also believe that there is another very important activity that is, uh, here I have a problem, monitoring, yeah, monitoring what the government does, okay? that is to control, to check the behavior of the prime minister, of the ministers, of the government as such. Okay? And if you re reduce the number of parliamentarians, you automatically re reduce those who are capable of controlling what the government does. That is, you reduce the ability of parliament to check uh, the, uh, the activities of the government. Italians have been complaining recently that the government has done very many things during the COVID period that could not be controlled, that were not controlled by parliament. They are right. But the fact is that if you reduce the number of parliamentarians, since very many, most parliamentarians work in committees, you will have a problem because the government and the ministers have a major support coming from their political staff. There is those that they can appoint themselves, right? and the bureaucratic staff, there is those working with the ministers, and parliamentarians have very few resources available to them. So you automatically create a disequilibrium, and I, do not, I cannot foresee what is going to take place, except that the government will acquire more political power, uh, which may be good in some cases, but generally speaking, it is not exactly what constitution makers usually consider important to have in a parliamentary democracy. Also, there has been a, comp a major complaint against the parliamentarians because they are, uh, how do you say, panulloni, do nothing individuals, do nothing individuals, and some of them do not sh really show up. Incidentally, this is not correct. If you look at the numbers, it is not correct. But in any case, this was one of the motivations you used to say, cut them, because in any case, some of them do not work and some of them do not even appear in parliament. The point is 
that if you cut them, you also cut those who work and those who appear. In any case, the problem is, as Donatella was saying, how you select the parliamentarians. And you, with the existing electoral law, the, or the parliamentarians or all parliamentarians were in fact selected by party leaders and by faction leaders. And unless you significantly redraft the electoral law, this is going to take place in the next parliament as well, which will be elected probably in 2023. So this is a bad reform from many points of view, and will, will not, it will not improve the functioning of the Italian political system. As to the relationship uh, within, can we talk about the regions now? Mm -hmm. or should I stop? No, no, no. no. Uh, when you look at the results of regional elections, uh, let me give you a couple of uh, good news. First of all, Italians vote in free and fair elections. Okay, this is important because I get some news coming from a not so far away country where apparently there is some, someone who is willing to suppress the vote. Okay. No, Italian elections are free and fair. There is no voter suppression. I would add, there is usually a very, very small amount of electoral fraud. Okay? This is important as well. But all this said, obviously what is very, very important is that Italian, Italian voters rarely get enough info, information. That is, let me say that it is not true what you will probably hear someone saying, that the voters are always right. No, the voters are not always right because some of them vote on the basis of a limited amount of information, a limited amount of interest, and they vote because, well, it is time to go to vote, okay? So there is a, there are very many voters who vote according to, let's say, some emotions, according to, can I say, the tide, following the tide, following the tide. All this said, however, in some cases, you, you as uh, a member of government, a uh, party leader and so on, can in fact create the tide. And if there is a winner in the referendum, is most certainly the leader of the five, well, the almost leader of the five stars movement. Okay? But he was, uh, he was surfing the tide, if I can put it this way. That is the anti-parliamentary sentiment and the anti-political uh, uh, emotions, I would say, have always been here. In the past, they were contained and in, in a way reduced by political parties. Italian political parties are, have become very, very weak. One can say that they've disappeared. There is only one party at this point in time whose name is Partito, Partito Democratico. All the other parties do not call themselves parties, Movimento, Lega, Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, and so on, okay? Forza Italia, all right. Now, so there is one winner. But the winner of the referendum is not the winner of the regional elections. Indeed, the Five, Star move, five Stars movement have done very poorly in the various regional elections. In some cases, they were almost producing the defeat of the candidate of the center left. This is the case of Puglia. And, and therefore, there will be some tensions within the governmental coalition. One final point, which I, I think is important, uh, that this ought to be a situation in which new reforms, new revisions will have to take place. Uh, I think that this is, let me say, a, probably a hope or probably an illusion that reforms will follow. It is easy to, to identify one target and, and to produce that revision. It is much more complicated to produce an overall change of the Italian constitution and of the electoral law as well. So this is not the beginning of something. This is the end of the first long step the Five Stars movement wanted to make. It does not necessarily mean that there will be something good following all this. The government will have uh, very many other, other uh, problems to solve. One of them is to get the money from the European Union. And the second is to spend the money if we get it. So there will be very many other things to do. One, one final point. That is, I would say that this is not the first step. This is a jump, jump in the dark. Can I say so? Mm -hmm. Jump in the dark. Uh, as a citizen, I do not really like jumping in, in the dark, 
but as a political scientist, Italy is a splendid case. I, mean, I get a lot of, of interesting things to do. I'm going to give interviews, write articles, being invited to the Bologna Center to discuss all this. So I'm very grateful to those politicians who always make mistakes and allow me to, be, to remain in business. One final point, very final, quarter. That is, we cannot really fully understand Italy if we just know Italy. From time to time, it is necessary to look at other countries. If we want to know one country, we must know something about other countries. Otherwise, we cannot say what is normal and what is exceptional, what is good and what is bad. So I would suggest that to look at other countries and specifically to those countries who are better governed than, than Italy, the case, the case in point will be Germany. I would suggest to look at Germany and to borrow some of the constitutional mechanisms, some of the constitutional clauses, because Germany has done very well and there's a lot to learn from Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Don Franco. Donatella, I want to come back to you. Can you hear me better now? Yes, okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Excellent. You raised a couple of points um, that, that Justin uh, picked up on. Uh, and John Franco as well. One of them is about this relationship between populism and the five star movement and their success. And I think if I understood the point that John Franco was making and, and the point that you were making, populism seems to have succeeded at the national level in the context of this, uh, of this reform. But if you look at what's going on at the regional level, it's not about populism, it's about competence and leadership, like Zaya, for example. So I guess that would be one question is, is the five star movement really just a symbolic national party now with no real, uh, real base at the regional level? And the second question is, please help us better to understand Georgia Maloney's role in this, uh, because Georgia Maloney is, is I, I think you rightly point out, a rising star in Italian politics. And the big question is, why? Why is she so successful? Okay, so many, many questions. Uh, I think that um, many things uh, coexist actually in this, in this story, in the sense that there is populism, but there has been also leadership factor, as I mentioned before. And at least my, my reading, my interpretation of the success of people like Zaya and um, and the Luca is certainly linked to the fact that they were able to project uh, an image of leadership, at least. Uh, they showed themselves uh, in command during the, the COVID crisis, and they are probably uh, they are probably forward, forwarded by from for this reason. I think that in particular. Um, and this is also connected to Giorgia Meloni, so, but let me say something more general about uh, the leadership in the, cent in the right, in the central right and in the right, because I think that the victory of, um, of Daya shows also that, uh, the, that Salvini is not the only uh, uh, indisputable leader in the, North, uh, in the league now, in the sense that he is the leader, but this means that there can be also an alternative uh, uh, men uh, and women that can play a role, and Zaya certainly is one of them. But is, it is interesting because Zaya represents in some ways uh, an older idea of the League, because Zaya is really a man of the North, so it's closer to the, the origins of the League. So this is the first point. The second point is that, on the other hand, Salvini is challenged also by the rise of Giorgia Meloni, as, as you mentioned. Meloni, uh, by the way, in this election, uh, uh, certainly can say that uh, she, she won because the, the candidate of the mark has been uh, indicated, may I say so, by Fratelli d'Italia. And I think Giorgia Meloni, of course, you know I'm a scholar of political communication, so I see everything through my lens. Giorgia Meloni is quite uh, innovative in terms of communication. She's, she's very able uh, in some ways. Uh, and, uh, she, and today, if I have to compare Salvini and Meloni, I think that she is the rising star, while Salvini was, from that point of view, the rising star a couple of years ago. Hmm? So they are similar because they are bo both uh, 
populi stand in some way also uh, they are both able to use uh, the popularization of politics but today the new thing is Meloni rather than Salvini at least this is my impression and in any case uh, um, I think that, that, uh, that there are new things in the central right in general as for the leadership then let me say something also about your question concerning the five star movement this is a, another very interesting point because i think it, it is another very fluid situation because uh, you know that the five star movement is in this process also of uh, remaking its leadership but an interesting point is that during this campaign de mayo as in any case shown that is still there even if uh, is no more formally the, the, the party leader and uh, they actually uh, have announced that they want uh, a, a change of leadership they won't think uh, again of leadership maybe in terms of a more collective leadership but we are waiting mm? and certainly also the uh, from a general point of view the outcome of the election uh, matters so that's clear so the, the Faisal movement, I think today is really in a transitional phase uh, and we can be able to, to say something more probably in, uh, in some months, but today it's difficult to judge what, uh, what may happen. And then there is also the problem of the leadership of the center left. We are discussing the problem of the leadership in the center left for ages, I think. Uh, in any case, uh, today the Partito Democratico can be happier than maybe than expected. So also the, uh, his leader uh, should be more satisfied than, than expected and uh, probably the, the issue of the leadership of the center left will be not, not uh, really faced uh, uh, quite soon, I think. This is my, my first impression, okay? I'm improvising <laughs> because we are all improvising since we are seeing, we are seeing the, 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 the result uh, now. So it's not so easy even to make prediction. We are just reacting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Super, thank you. Um, Justin, I want to come back to a point that, that, that you made that seemed to me to be different from the point that John Franco was making. Um, you seem to be making the point that now that we've had this referendum, the big parentheses over constitutional reform has been closed, and it's possible for this parliament to be dissolved and for us to go to new elections. Uh, and indeed, there are so many reforms that need to be made in, in, in legislative statutes that this parliament may not be able to make because this government doesn't really have the kind of majority that's required, that it's possible to imagine this government getting jammed up, particularly when you add the, the political reforms to the big economic packages that have to be done. But John Franco seems to believe that this parliament is going to last all the way to 2023, uh, presumably on the assumption that, that nobody in this parliament wants to lose their job and if the parliament gets resolved, dissolved, many of them will experience that horrible outcome. So, so what is it? Do we, do we think this government is going to trundle forward? Oh, and one last thing on that. Where's Conte been all this time? What is, what is, where's Conte been all this time? He's been a, kind of an invisible figure in the context of this whole debate. Okay. In actual fact, I, if, if John Franco was thinking that this... this uh, this parliament will last till 2023, I agree with him. There is, but uh, I don't want to bore people with sort of a constitutional argument that would say that because we have reformed the two houses of parliament, we have reduced the number of uh, deputies and senators from 400 and 200 respectively, then really this parliament should not last uh, much longer and we should go to an election. But that is high constitutional theory, uh, the idea that in a certain sense this parliament is partially delegitimized de by the fact that it has been modified and reduced in, the num in terms of the number of members. But if I embrace real politique, I think that uh, it is highly likely that this, this uh, government will continue until 2023 uh, for a series of reasons. Uh, one, the election of the President of the Republic. Um, Italy is a parliamentary republic. 
and the president is elected by parliament in joint session. And I think this uh, majority, which uh, is a very peculiar majority, I uh, leave it to my colleagues to talk about how cohesive it is or not, but they certainly will want to have a say in who will be the next uh, uh, president of the, of the Republic. So I think they will do all they can to, to avoid going to an election before, before 2022, I believe, is the year that uh, there has to be a re-election. Uh, I'm going to throw out my prediction right now. I wouldn't be surprised if Mattarella is forced to, to stand uh, for, another, uh, for another seven years because they, the, the, this uh, parliament might find itself in a similar situation to, to 2013 when they had to plea with Napolitano to stay, stay in office. But maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Um, one of the reasons why I think this government will stay until 2023 is that, again, um, Conte, the fact that Conte has uh, kept a sort of low profile is a, a perfect move. In a way, we could, and again, I'm looking at Gianfranco and Donatella to see what they say about this, it's almost the attitude of a typical Christian democratic politician of the First Republic who maintains a nice pro low profile but continues to remain in power. Um, he avoided getting into any discussions with regard to uh, the referendum, kept well out of the way with regard to the regional election, so as to, to avoid it being a referendum for or against Conte, big mistake that Renzi made in 2016. The regional elections being before or against Conte, big mistake made by D'Alema a few years earlier, and so on and so forth. So he, he's kept out of these uh, discussions so far and continues to, to use an Italian expression to navigate. Also because with the recovery funds and so on and so forth coming, uh, here there is an issue of being able to make some important decisions with regard to very large amounts of money that will that that uh, hopefully Italy will uh, will be receiving soon. Um, if I may pick up on a on a on, on a couple of things said my by my my colleagues, one thing that Gianfranco is absolutely right about that. Uh, sometimes is a, is a misconception with regard to Italy. Italy has serious problems of corruption, but we, Italy does not have serious pro problems of electoral fraud, especially in the national elections. What I would like to say, and I'd, I'd like to hear Gianfranco on this one, here I'm worried because the last thing I want to see, and I am an old referendario degli anni 90, I don't want to see us go back to proportional representation with multiple preferences because one of the things that we were able to prove without doubt was the capacity through multiple preferences of being able to control the vote and for electoral fraud to be much stronger. So this is something I really would like to see avoided. Germany is our model. Okay, Germany can be our model. Then, from a constitutional point of view, we have to take everything that goes with the German constitutional model. We can't do cherry picking. And by the way, this, this referendum, reducing the number of parliamentarians, goes in exactly the opposite direction with respect to, to what we would have in Germany. Germany, because of the electoral law that is adopted in Germany, has a variable number of members of the Bundestag because it will depend how the result and the vote goes in the single member constituencies with respect to the result in the, in the proportional representation. But may I say this, can I be elitist for a second? I'm pretty certain that people like Di Maio and Di Battista just simply don't understand these technical issues and therefore they're not, gonna, not going to be able to go in that direction. We want, the, we want the German system? Then let us adopt the Bundesrat and have a second chamber, a Senate that represents the regional governments of uh, Italy. We want the German system, then let us introduce a constructive vote of no confidence, which is expressed only by one of the two chambers. Because the other thing that this uh, reform does not resolve is the big problem of Italy's perfect bicameralism which isn't, and Gianfranco is right from this point of view, the difficulties in proving laws. We, 
We debated in 2016, but on one thing we didn't debate, because see, it's right, de facto, in the Italian system, on, on, the, on lawmaking, we have a monocameralismo de facto, because it's either the Senate or the Chamber of Deputies that decides on about 80% of the bills. The big anomaly is the fact that every Italian government has to have the confidence separately of the Chamber and the Senate. And this is, is prob problematic when it then comes to forming uh, governments. So we would be able to resolve this immediately by introducing a, uh, a Senate that represents uh, the regions. But my impression is that we're going in another, in another direction completely. John Franco, I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that many of the people in the audience ha don't have the, the, the kind of breadth of political analysis that would be required to compare these discrete electoral systems and things like that. And they also, I think, would, would benefit, if, if you could, from some clarification of this notion of populism, right? I mean, it's very difficult for me to understand how the Lega, which has been in a series of national governments over a number of decades, and in fact is the oldest political movement that's operating in the country right now, uh, is called a populist party. Um, because it doesn't seem to be populist. It seems to be elites. It's just grumpy elites or center-right elites or however you want to call it. Um, and, and, and indeed, if Donatello was, what Donatello was telling us is, is in fact happening, the Five Star Movement seems to be evolving into a political party, not, not rejecting politics altogether, but it seems to have gotten away from its two-mandate two uh, requirement, and, and, and so it seems to be normalizing as well. So, so are we seeing the triumph of populism in Italy, or are we seeing what was populism at one point evolving into the mainstream and transforming Italian politics in some fundamental way? Pasquino reflects. <laughs> uh, populism, there is always some populism in contemporary democracies, okay? Uh, my sentence would be there is always a streak of populism. Uh, in the Italian case, uh, both the Five Stars Movement and the Lega have always had more than a streak. It is that they believe in a sort of direct relationship between one leader and the people. Okay? Obviously, those who do not support them are technically the enemies of the people. Okay? So this is going on significantly since the beginning. I mean, the Bossi, the founder of the, of the Lega, was definitely a populist, believing that there was the people of the North the people of Padania, it is the region going from Piedmont to, to Emilia-Romagna, even though you will never find the populace in Romagna and to a large extent not even in, in Emilia, except the northern part of Emilia that is technically almost Lombardy. The idea that you do not need uh, intermediate associations because the leader understands you and the leader will tell you that he indeed uh, listens to you and understands you. You, you do not talk with the leader because he doesn't want to interact with you. It is the, the bearer of some possible changes of very many good things. Uh, and there is one other element within the Five Stars movement uh, that is populist. Uh, that is that the, uh, the element of expertise, of political and professional experience, of competence, uh, do not count at all. That is, we are all equal. Uno vale uno. One is equal one. Okay, which obviously it is not true for obvious reasons, and and especially during the COVID period, it was not true because we had to believe the experts, the physicians, and, and so on, the scientists. Okay, this has changed somewhat. By the way, this has changed, and what what follows is that the Five Stars Movement got something like 28 percent, 33 percent of the votes in March in 2018, and now it is down. I take the, the most successful of their candidates in Puglia, it is down to 14%, from 33 to 14%, meaning that it was a breakthrough in, 19, in 2018. Incidentally, the highest percentage ever of, of a, this kind of party, and now it is back to uh, 14, which is not very much. Let me also add that there was an, an element of populism in the prime minister himself, 
when he was appointed, he said, I'm going to be the lawyer of the people, l'avvocato del popolo. If you are a prime minister, you are not the lawyer of the people. You are the leader. You are someone who has the power to indicate the way, to, to shape the, the future in a way. So he had this kind of populist inclination, I would say. I, I'm, I cannot say whether this was by because of conviction or because of convenience, okay? Now he has learned, that is probably the most important development in Italian politics in the last uh, uh, year or so, is that we have a prime minister who has learned a lot, who knows how to behave, who has, been, who has become very popular. 60% of the Italians say they, they have a, a, a high level of acceptance uh, uh, for the prime minister. And also, which is very important, we often forget he has been very good at the European level. He has been capable of negotiating, he has been intransigent, and he has shown himself to be capable of translating what he got at the European level into Italian public policies. So this is the real, the real change. Uh, w one thing on the, the future of the government, uh, Justin was right, of course, uh, the top priority is to elect the next president of the Republic. I, I think that Mar Mattarella doesn't want to be re-elected. Uh, uh, incidentally, there are I several... I agree, I don't think he does either. There are several candidates are already vying for, for that office uh, for different reasons. Traditionally, the Speaker of the Senate, who is the second office uh, in terms of importance, believes automatically that he or she, and now she, he is a she, and so it, it, there is an what is important. It will be the first female to to become president of the republic. She has been the first female to become a speaker of the senate. So there are some uh, interesting developments of this. But there is one other element which is very important. As long as this parliament survives, the five stars and the Partito Democratico have the majority to elect the president. Okay, so numbers count. If there is a new election, it is very unlikely that they will have this kind of majority. So they are obliged to stay together until January, end of January, beginning of February 2022. If they succeed in electing the President of the Republic, then there is no reason why they should not go on until the end of the, of the parliamentary term, 2023, okay? Um, one, numbers are important, okay? This is a country with, where mathematicians are not held in high esteem, but numbers are important. The German Bundestag theoretically has 598 uh, parliamentarians. Today it has 709 because, as Justin was saying, there are uber hung mandat, and if there is a German in the audience can correct my, my pronunciation. All, all, perfect, perfect is too much, but thank you, thank you. So uh, this also is important because it, it is flexible. So it represents, in fact, the German, uh, German voters. Uh, and while if you, if you reduce the number of parliamentarians, automatically you, you create very large constituencies and some of them will be unmanageable. Or in order to become manageable, the candidates will have to spend a lot of money. So what you, what you save in terms of of money for the, the parliamentarians you will spend when the next candidates will have to run in large constituencies. So this, uh, they, they said that it was a matter of saving one coffee per year for uh, the 50, 51 million Italians. Uh, well, in, in that case, obviously, it, uh, it is not a decisive argument. But uh, again, we lost. Uh, I'm, I'm, very sorry to tell you that we lost. We lost the battle of the numbers, the battle of the years we are going to continue, right? <laughs> Thank you, John Franco. We, we do want to get some questions from the audience. We also want to get some questions from the, the 50 odd people who have joined us online. If you're online, please post your question in the question and answer box which you'll find at the middle of the bottom of your screen. So you can do that and I'll, I'll field your questions that way. Uh, but if you're here, please just put your hand up and I'll recognize you. Now the only trick is when I recognize you, 
I need you to tell me your name, since I can't recognize any of you behind those masks. So tell me your name, uh, and it would help also if you would tell us where you're from, so that we can keep track of the question flow. Yes, sir. Uh, wait for the microphone, because if you don't, then the people online won't be able to hear your question. So am I audible like this? You're audible online, and then you have to speak loud, so you're audible in the room. All right, so I'll just talk like this. My name is Thanos. I'm from the Netherlands, and my question is for Professor Frosini. Uh, you mentioned that uh, a couple of times now there is the importance for regional representation, and you advocated for maybe the Senate moving towards more regional representation. Why exactly would that be so important for the national level to have such a strong regional representation as Definitely not all European countries have this strong European representation on the national level. Justin, do you mind if I collect no, a couple of no, questions? No, no, no. Are there any other questions in the audience? Because it would be good to collect a couple. So I've got two gentlemen. Is there, are, are there any women who want to ask a question? If we can go to the back there and then we'll... we'll... Thanos. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Bianca. Uh, I'm from Italy, from the Veneto specifically. Uh, so I have two questions. One is uh, for, for Donatella, and it's in regards to whether Zaya specifically, whether as he did so well getting something like over 70% is currently projected, and is that really due to rhetoric that we can label as populist? Or is his success more tied to something that kind of exceeds and transcends populism because of how he was able to succeed pragmatically with COVID? Is it right to label him as, as a populist then? And then my, my second question is, is for Justin and Gianfranco in regards to when we compare uh, the German system to the Italian system, how much is, is of that needs to be uh, discussed within the idea of regional development differences between Germany and Italy? Uh, because Italy has a lot more left behind quote unquote st uh, situations than Germany does. So how does that kind of factor into the consideration when we compare their, their constitutional structure? Okay, if we can get the gentleman in the jacket right there. Hi, my name is uh, Trevor Odom. I'm from the United States. And my question is for uh, Professor uh, Frosini. And uh, how would, because you are a big advocate of adopting the German system for the Italian way, possibly increase populism even more for the right wing parties that says we're adopting another system of government. How do you see that playing in Italy a major issue? Okay, we've got one more question. I had seen a hand there in the middle somewhere. No? Oh, it's you uh, with the blue cap on. Did, did, you're, you're done? Okay, so why don't we do this? Donatella, do you want to start off and then we'll, we'll hand over to the gentleman in the room? Okay, yes, uh, thank you, Bianca. I think um, there is a mix of things in the case of Zaya. Certainly the pragmatic issue and the, the management of COVID mattered. Zaya is clearly uh, appreciated by many people that may be uh, do not vote for him as well. Uh, however, uh, Zaya he, he belongs to a populist party. I totally agree with the description uh, Professor Pasquino offered uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, the Northern League was a populist party. Salvini's League is a populist party as well. And if I can add just uh, uh, things, even if uh, the question did not concern uh, this uh, uh, precisely, but I think we should uh, keep in mind the difference between uh, the two kinds of populism represented by the League and by the Five Star Movement. Because they have many things in common, the anti-establishment, uh, the idea that uh, we have to bypass intermediaries, that this is really true. But while the, the League is more in line with the radical populist right, uh, well uh, represented in Europe, and we can uh, make a different example, think of uh, Marine Le Pen's party and so on, the Five Star Movement is quite uh, unusual. 
And uh, if I can repeat what I said before, the issue of leadership is interesting because the Five Star Movement relies on a sort of collective leadership. There is a group of people. So uh, it, it's not the typical populist party that relies on, so much on a strong uh, leader, a charismatic leader. Maybe the beginning was different because there was Grillo, but now we are talking about the Five Star Movement now. So there are differences between the two. And uh, I, but to be back to the question, I think that in any case, Zaya belongs to a populist party. And so uh, it is a representative of a certain attitude and certain approach. But there are also other elements mentioned before. Okay, thank you. Super. Justin, do you want to come to the questions? I think Thanos, Bianca, and Trevor had questions. Yeah, they're, they're, I think they're all, they can all be connected to one another. In the sense, Fanus, no, you're, you're right in the sense that, there, of course, there are lots of countries in, in, in Europe, including, including the Netherlands, that don't have such a strong uh, representation of, of the regions. Indeed, I believe your, your system is unicameral. There isn't even a, sort of a, a second chamber representing the regions or, or something like that. So the, the fact of the matter is that, however, in Italy, the uh, regional element is uh, uh, very strong. You just have to ask uh, our Mike man. He will underline very clearly that he, uh, Marchetti, is from Romagna and not from Emilia. Okay, these uh, these elements also in terms of identification are important. But apart from apart, apart from this issue, uh, the the uh, regional setup of Italy is very important, and it has been enhanced since the constitutional reform of two thousand and one, uh, which I think had pros and cons to it, but is certainly uh, transformed Italy to to a certain extent some even talk about a quasi federal system if we were to uh, make a comparison between uh, the Italian regions and the German lender there are a lot of similarities the Italian regions actually for example in terms of competences and powers that they can exercise are stronger than the, than the Austrian lender so uh, it would seem to be a logical uh, consequence for uh, there to be a chamber of the regions and the model that I personally would follow would be the German one to bring the regional governments into uh, the lawmaking uh, process at, uh, uh, at national level. Let me go to the third question and underline this. What I was saying, and I agreed with what Jan, Gianfranco was underlying, and to your question, Jack, um, I'm not necessarily saying that Germany is our is our model. I've, on certain things, I'm I'm a bit divided as to as to what institutional reforms Italy ought to bring in. What I am saying is that if we are going to carry out a legal transplanting, then we should do it taking the system as a whole and not cherry picking uh, just certain things that we uh, that we like about it. Uh, the issue, and I, this is a very interesting question that you've posed, it's obvious that uh, it would not be Germany imposing their system on us and the way that it would be uh, discussed in Italy would not be, oh, we're taking the German system and we're going to adopt it here, it would be fruit of a debate, which, and this might be interesting for you, you'll discover that there are actually lots of components of Italy's centre-right and there's right-wing that actually are actually attracted to certain aspects of Germany's institutional system. I'm thinking in particular of uh, people, I'm sure if we talk to Luca Zaya from Veneto, he would uh, be very much in favour of the idea of turning Italy's Senate into a centre of the regions where the Veneto region would have a, a say at national level. Bianca, you're, you're right, I'm not an economist and therefore I cannot today say how having a senator of the regions would improve and uh, close the gap in terms of the difference between the levels of development of the different regions in Italy. What I can say is that the system we've had up until now has not worked and with regard to Germany, we have Germans in the room that can maybe comment on this with, uh, with greater precision but my impression is that when Germany was reunified with their own institutional system under the basic law of 1949, they were able to englobe the Eastern lender of Germany 
and to reduce the gap in terms of the difference between the lender in Western Germany and Eastern Germany under that institutional system. I'm not saying that that is the only reason why uh, there has been regional developments in the East. It's not only because of the institutional setup, but it appears to me from outside that the institutional setup did not pose an obstacle to that development. And therefore, maybe from this point of view, it might actually be a good thing for, uh, for Italy. John Franco, I know you've, you've uh, got responses to the questions that were asked from the floor, but we've also got a couple of questions that have come in uh, on the Q&A. Uh, one is from Antonio, uh, who asks, did the, did the right actually fail in this election? Would you, would you consider this to be a part of the descent of the center right from its high watermark, particularly for the Lega in, in, in the European parliamentary elections in 2019? Uh, and indeed, could we see a change in the Lega, a challenge coming from Zaya that might transform the movement? Uh, and Niall asked whether, uh, whether you could speculate what would it take to collapse this coalition government right now? What would be the conditions that would be required? Um, I'm going to do another round more, so I'll get back to you. Go ahead. Uh... No, the, the right did not really lose very much. In fact, it, it won one more region, uh, Le Marque. And so to, to some extent, it can be satisfied. Obviously, if, if they thought that they were going to win in Tuscany and in Puglia as well, this was a very, very high expectation. And, and so far, as, uh, f according to what we know, they've not succeeded. But on the other hand, what will count then it is the number of votes, the, especially Fratelli d'Italia will have received. The candidate of Fratelli d'Italia is the one who won the, the region market. Let me let is, uh, add one word on, on Giorgia Meloni, because she is, I will put it this way, short and sharp. Uh, uh, and she is a, a capable traditional politician. She went to a school because the neo-fascists had a, a political school. She learned a lot and she, she is also capable of keeping away from the mistakes that Salvini has made in recent times. The second question has to do with the, the what would it take for the government to collapse? Mistakes. Politicians make mistakes. Uh, in some cases they they um, bet on something they cannot uh, obtain, uh, they cannot achieve. Uh, probably the major mistake will have to do with the inability to choose good projects to be financed by the European Union and then to be capable of spending the money in time. This is going to be the test of the present government, the test of Conte, I would say, and the test of the Minister of Finance. Fortunately, both are good enough. That is, the Minister of Finance is also very good for one other reason, that is he was a member of the European Parliament. He speaks good English, he's well known, he's reliable. And so we have an asset, so to speak. And we also have one other asset, that our uh, commissioner is uh, uh, Gentiloni, who was a former Prime Minister, and who was reliable when he was a Prime Minister. So there is no reason why he should not be reliable at this point in time. Coda on the, the Veneto. Zaya believes that Veneto is a sort of uh, uh, Bavaria, okay? And, and, and therefore it, it, ought, it ought to have a, a tremendous amount of autonomy. Veneto to some extent is similar to Bavaria because the Catholic Church is very powerful. It's very power, powerful also in terms of associations, in terms of banks, in terms of schools and so on. So this produces the votes for, for Zaya because the left has, has historically been very weak and it has never succeeded in, in, in relating to the church and relating to the Catholics. And this obviously produces success for Zaya. Zaya has been good, I would say, on the whole. Not outstanding, but good, good enough. John Franco, I know you have to leave. At uh, <coughs> 7.41, 42. <laughs>
Oh, it's okay. on telly. So I'm, uh, <clears throat> what I, I have two questions that have come in on the chat. Uh, and then I want to get Moritz's question. Uh, if I can ask Donatella and, and Justin to stick around even after John Franco takes off, uh, that would be great. Moritz, why don't we start with your question and then I'll read the questions from the chat. So um, what strikes me is how little uh, in this discussion so far uh, there's been some actual policy questions, how some seemingly irrelevant based on this discussion have been in uh, the elections, uh, which is especially striking because as opposed to previous years where, you know, some populism was in full throttle in Europe, uh, it was very much focused on um, cultural aspect, identities, uh, people, etc., etc. Now in 2020, you have actually issues that low intensity voters care about economy economic recovery covid etc cetera, etc cetera. where has that gone there's been very little some of discussions about that is that just still a non factor is some of the cultural identity issue still such a some of big issue in italian politics why don't you go ahead john franco and then <laughs> i know you have to go by 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 saying cultural identity you would say Italy first, something like this, because if Italy first, yes, obviously, Salvini is, in fact, for Italy first, for Italians first. To some extent, Giorgia Meloni has to be Italy first, because this, she is the heir of fascism, to some extent, even though she always says that she was born in 1975, so you cannot, accu cannot accuse her of being a fascist. On the other hand, the, the name of the party is Fratelli d'Italia, chosen, this by the way is, is a line from the, the Italian national anthem. Okay? So the, the, the cultural identity is there, that is the exploitation. The left remains identified with internationalism, with, with cosmopolitanism. So it is less nationalist than the, the center right. Since you are a German, let me, let me conclude with one, one famous sentence. The Germans love Italians, but do not admire them. Italians admire the Germans, but do not love them. Thank you very much, Gianfranco. <clears throat> We're going to take two questions from, from the internet, but I think we should give Gianfranco a round of applause before we leave. Thank you. Thank you. Donatella, I think this next question is for you, actually. Uh, and, and it has to do with the effect of reducing the size of the two chambers. The questions that's come in has been, <clears throat> well, if you have fewer parliamentarians and they have to spend more money campaigning, won't this necessarily professionalize politics more in Italy and stop these insurgent movements from gaining so much traction? Well, uh, I read the, the question, I was thinking of it. I tend to think that in a country where uh, there is a strong uh, populist feeling, uh, and uh, as I said before, and Gianfranco said, uh, this idea of anti-politics, anti uh, the opportunity for insurgent uh, populist movement and, uh, uh, and parties remain high. In any case, consider that uh, uh, usually insurgent populist movement attract uh, att attention by the media. Think of the Five Star Movement, uh, the history of the Five Star Movement, uh, because uh, uh, from the very beginning, this uh, new movement was a, a really an issue and all the television and the, the media talk about it even if on the other uh, on the other hand grillo uh, wanted to stress his difference exactly by refusing campaigning the traditional way so that that was extremely interesting as an example of how really populist uh, movement in their insurgent phase can raise the media attention and so they, they always have the opportunity, also social media that are not really very costly, 
uh, help a lot that that form of uh, new uh, politics, new movements. So at the end, I don't know really. I don't know if uh, uh, certainly the, the the point of funding campaigns is a, a great issue, but I'm I'm not so sure that this is this will damage in particular populist uh, movement and party, in, especially in their insurgent phase. At least not not more than others. That's fine. Okay. Okay. I've I've had a question from Michael Lee, and then I'm trying to reconnect now, so I can get the last question from the chat. Uh, thanks very much, Eric. I'd just like to ask Justin why he said that um, Italy would need to take the German system all or nothing at all, um, and that you know taking elements of the German system would be cherry picking and wouldn't work. I mean, the German system arose in a very particular context and the stability of the German system for many years was based also on the system of grand coalitions that people questioned the impact on democracy, um, now apparently fragmenting and for some time actually forcing opponents into extra parliamentary movements because the whole political system was blocked by a grand coalition. Um, so it arose in a particular context and arguably it's now fragmenting. I mean, why not take elements such as the one that you mentioned, a flexible number of members, for example, without, wh why would Italy be required to, to take it lock, stock and barrel? Go ahead. Because I think a lot of a lot of the the elements of of, of German, uh, Germany's institutional system go together, um, because it's true. Uh, Germany has had to um, have a lot of grand coalitions in the last in the last few decades. Uh, there has been a fragmentation of the political system. But it has remained stable because, for example, there is the uh, constructive vote of no confidence. Take the constructive vote, vote of no confidence out of it, and that would be one element with which the whole thing would collapse. Um, the fact that the needs of the, of the lender are represented in the second chamber takes away an element of tension. It's true that the fact that there are regional elections at different times in Germany is an issue and it's been discussed in Germany as to how to, in some way to resolve this because every time Germany has a has a, an election in an important land uh, this takes on p p political significance but this is a problem also in other other countries including including Italy where we have these uh, regional elections. I mean, we had the regional elections in January and we're here talking about them. We're here now in September and we're talking about them. Um, there's also uh, another element that I think is, is, is important to, to uh, bear in mind, and that is the fact that there, there is a need uh, with regard to, to Italy to find some sort of representation for the regions in the uh, uh, in the national parliament as a kind of um, compensation valve or chamber, as it were, because otherwise we get into, as, and we've seen this during the pandemic, these uh, direct clashes between the uh, prime minister and the national government on one hand and the presidents of the regions on the other. Of course, Donatella is absolutely right. We didn't touch specifically on the effects of the pandemic on these elections, but the victories of Zaya in Veneto and uh, De Luca in Campania, I think, are a lot to do with the way that they uh, they handled the uh, uh, the pandemic. And the truth of the matter is that I think that a strong political class is also ex expressed at the regional level that we would then bring into into the into the national institutional framework. So the, the, I'm also, Michael, criticizing something that has happened in Italy a lot. We've had lots of different proposals for electoral reform that have been called Germanicum and so on, the German electoral system, but then they're, they're not. They're not the German electoral system at all. Gianfranco is gone, but I mean, he could say a lot more on this. So, so this sort of semi-copying and then supposedly legal transplanting is just false. 
And can I just say something, just 20, sure. 30 seconds on what Moritz said about there hasn't been a discussion about policies. If, if I may, for these regional elections, I think that this is, this is probably the, the, the issue. I don't think Salvini and, and co wanted to really make this a national election. They didn't go half as far as they did in January when we had the, the elections in Emilia Romagna and so on and so forth. I think because Salvini realized that it didn't work the last time and he was, he was sort of in a kind of limbo. Uh, these regional elections have been politicized nationally only to a certain extent. And what has happened basically is I think in a lot of the regional, they've been talking about regional issues and moreover, and again, I refer to what Donatella said at the beginning, not by chance, big win for m most of the incumbents in two cases and a confirmation of good government in Toscana. Gianni was not the incumbent uh, president, but he has been in uh, regional politics for a long time. The uh, centre-left have governed the Tuscany for, for many decades, and I think fundamentally the Tuscans wanted to maintain uh, that sort of stability. Uh, in the national government, something that might cause tensions from tomorrow is a discussion about, and Eric can certainly say more about this, the European stability mechanism. At a certain point, Zingaretti has to re return to a balance within this government. He said yes, he got his party to officially say yes to this referendum, even though there were a lot of people in the Democratic Party that were very skeptical. At this point, the Five Star Movement have to give something back in political terms, otherwise this coalition is going to have problems. Donatella, I want to give you the last word for two reasons. One, because we'd, we'd love to hear what you think. And the other is because you're the only one of us that can actually see the questions in the chat. <laughs> so if you, could, if you could open up the chat window and if there's, I think there's a question that I failed to address uh, or just tell us whatever you have as a final thought before we close this evening. Uh, well, there is an interesting question from Antonio Carapella that asks about uh, uh, regional, the, the future of regionalist politics uh, and uh, if there will be the room of uh, reorient populism to broader ideological goals. So I think this is connected also to what uh, Justin was saying before. Uh, honestly, I think that Salvi uh, sometimes ago Salvini's bet was that of transforming the Northern League in the League. And uh, certainly this uh, outcome, this, this particular election uh, should make him reflect, uh, should make uh, the, le the League in general to reflect on, uh, on this opportunity, on this possibility. If we look at, uh, at the, the first the result, but of, of course it's difficult to answer this question now. We have to, to see the, 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 the single parties' uh, electoral outcomes. But if you look uh, at the general uh, um, performance of the, of the president of regions, uh, it, the, the central right, uh, the central uh, left, one with the Luca is, is probably going to win with Emiliano as well. So I think this bet is still uh, quite uncertain if, if uh, it can really be won from that point of view. And so the, the, the idea of uh, 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 sending a more general, less regionalist message worked, but I don't know how far and to what extent may really be the, 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 winning, uh, the winning idea in the long term. But honestly, it's quite difficult to reason um, without having the, the electoral results. Thank you so much, Donatella, and thank you, Justin. This has been really Pleasure. fascinating. I mean, I'll, uh, what I should say is that, that when we planned this event, we had in the back of our minds the, the real fear that something bad could happen in these elections that would disrupt not just Italian politics, but European politics more generally. Uh, and that didn't happen, so that's a good sign. And I think a lot of the reason that it didn't happen is the, the reflected in Moritz's question. I think it didn't happen because Italy actually has been well run in, in the context of this coronavirus pandemic, uh, and because the voters have respected that. And whether that kind of goodwill lasts remain to be seen, but, but I think that the idea that competence in politics is rewarded 
uh, is, is worth bearing in mind. Uh, competence on the audience is rewarded as well. You guys have been terrific. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I hope you'll join me in giving a round of applause to Donatella and to Justin. Uh, we've really enjoyed having you, but we've really enjoyed having them. Thank you very much. A final thing, uh, next Thursday, so in three days, uh, we're gonna have the former Finnish Prime Minister, Alexander Stubb, speaking in this seminar series. He's the new director of the School of Public Policy in Florence. Um, he will be online and we're talking now about whether we'll do a mixed uh, event or, or an all online event. In any event, he is a fascinating figure with some really interesting ideas about where Europe is headed and I would encourage you all to attend. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>